I would say, looking at our culture now, that the time of Homo sapiens has come to an end. Our relationship to tools and machines has reached a whole new level. Now they are part of us. And this is a change that easily uh, outranks anything that's happened since Homo sapiens came on the scene. It's the age of Homo cyborg. The cyborg is a human-machine hybrid, like Frankenstein and his Hollywood descendants. Some academics believe that we are all now cyborgs. Humans merge with a technology that intimately surrounds us and enters our bodies. development of tools, the discovery of fire, the building of the cities, the great world wars, the spread of one world culture are all important and actually they're all steps towards, now we can see, they're all steps towards this development of homo cyborg. We have used technology to develop our abilities, enhance our functions and increase our power. It is our other half. We are techno bodies in a techno landscape. We live in stone age bodies. We've basically, by the way in which we organise ourselves socially, uh, taken the, the Darwinian process of natural selection out of the species. Now, some people would say, well, OK, that means that, that we actually have to, to uh, deal with our deficiencies by bolting on uh, bits of technology. interesting that we have so few stories to explain our relationships to technology. The one that everyone knows is the Frankenstein story. And the Frankenstein story is very interesting. It talks about a relationship to technology in terms of responsibility. If we turn away from what we've produced, the machines that we've created, um, they return to haunt us. Hollywood cyborg haunts us, a cinematic icon of techno fear, a 21st century Frankenstein, cynical, heartless, a threat to our humanity. But away from the fantasy, our communion with technology seems a beneficial affair. Half a million humans are happy to embrace cyborgian status by having their hip joints replaced by metal and plastic. Now their operations are being taken over by robots. The toughest part that we have at surgery is how to prepare this bone to match this implant. The part in the socket is fairly straightforward. It's spherical and we can prepare it fairly easily to prepare it and the socket is fairly easily visualized. It's very difficult to visualize what's going on inside the femur bone and to prepare it accurately for the implant. A three-dimensional scan of the patient's femur is loaded into a computer workstation, orthodox, and the surgeon plans the best match of implant and drilled bone. The robot then carries out that plan exactly. We provide the surgeon a very, very precise tool to then execute that plan that he did in his office. And that tool is a robot, which is in essence a computer controlled uh, five axis machine that machines out the cavity in the proper location and the proper shape in that patient's femur. This first patient was 64 years old and he'd had a three times operated on his other hip and he wanted to have this one done by the robot so hopefully it wouldn't have to be done again.
there are many, many examples of computer-controlled devices that our lives rely on every day. And that's what this, in essence, is. It happens to be called a robot, but it's, in essence, a computer-controlled device. Every airplane, every elevator, most train systems are all run and controlled by computers. We've now loaded in the cutting bit that is actually on the end of this uh, milling uh, machine. And uh, now the robot's working down inside the femur. It's carving out the exact shape of the implant, and it's carving it out in the position that we planned it on the orthodox. At this point, we're basically watching the robot work. Now the robot has done its work. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes to mill the femur. Now the implant is driven into place. It's done by hand. And uh, now the implant is uh, seated in the femur and we're done with the case. It's much better, we think, to plan out what you want before surgery and then be able to execute it rather than relying on the feel of the surgeon. That's why some surgeons are wonderful and some surgeons aren't. It's, it's a feel, it's, a, it's almost an art rather than a science. And the problem is that's difficult to control. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. We're trying to make sure that it works well every time. Humans losing control to monster machines is an old fear. The cyborg has become its latest incarnation. But the cyborg wasn't the product of fiction. It was born out of scientific research. The cyborg was created by Dr. Manfred Kleins in 1960 for the US space program. A neuropsychologist, he suggested re-engineering humans to live in space without spacesuits. The idea stayed on paper, but science fiction liked the word. For 30 years, Kleins has been dismayed by the image of his cyborg as a violent threat. He now wants to reassert the benefit of his concept to humanity. It's a total travesty of that concept, what has happened in films. The one that Schwarzenegger starred in is a Terminator. The dehumanizing of the cyborg is completely false. Uh, the cyborg has the same humanity, the same essence of humanness in them as any other person. We all know, for example, a person with a some kind of artificial leg or, or glasses or whatever help is in no way changed as, a, as an individual. Carlin Pierce has had an artificial arm since childhood. I think if you thought about it as a person or if you thought about a, a robot being a person, you should tend to relax on what you call it. You shouldn't be as harsh actually in the naming of it because it's not a robot it's part of a person whereas I mean you wouldn't call this a robotic arm because it's a normal arm so why call this a robotic arm it's a part of me it's part of my arm so if a robot was half person and half robot I'd call that person a person not a robot this is what the old bionic man was all about was was putting chips into bits of bodies and making it move it was very freaky uh, not so long ago. But once you start to use it in a way that, that adds something to your life, then it's a different thing altogether. In many ways, it's my best friend. Uh, that's how I think of it. Um, because everything that I do, I couldn't do without it. Sometimes I see myself in the mirror and I think, oh, Christ, that really, is that really me? Because sometimes I find it very difficult to relate to. Uh, when it's not part of me, when it is, I feel completely at one with it. Kleins's cyborg spaceman had intravenous pumps and slow-release drug systems which sustained him without conscious control. Kleins's ideas came from his work on cybernetics, the means by which all systems, computers and humans, regulate their function. 
He believes that, like a cyclist, we all unconsciously monitor and use feedback from machines. I would say a, a person riding a bicycle is already a simple cyborg because the skill of riding the bike becomes completely automated after a while. And once you have learned it, then it becomes part of your system. And you can ride a bike with as great naturalness virtually as walking. When you use tools, you're very conscious of the tools. And you are manipulating the tools and your attention is focused on the tools a lot. With a cyborg, all this happens just as unconsciously as your heart is beating. You don't have to worry about when the next beat of your heart occurs. You don't have to worry uh, how your blood pressure regulation is going at this moment, um, and so on. The human capacity can be extended, increased in desirable ways that go far beyond what a bicycle can do. And that would be the realm of a cyborg. Intelligent artificial limbs are a perfect example of a cyborg concept. The technology monitors the human, and the human unconsciously absorbs the machine. Alistair Proctor, once a professional cyclist, lost his leg in a car crash. He's had a mechanical leg for the last 20 years, and is now getting an electronic one. The previous leg, I had to make that do all the work. There's no motors in there, it's all coming from, from me, from my movements. Um, and what the electronics does, which is, is potentially fabulous once I get used to it, is that it takes the thinking out of walking. It makes it a much more um, natural thing to happen, which is really what I'm after. Okay, off you go. Ready? Yep, fast walking. It's unique in that it's the first microprocessor controlled swing face device. It can monitor the speed of walking of each individual patient and adjust the resistance of the swing face depending on the speed of the patient. Nice and easy. The wedding walk. Right. Your wedding walk, shopping. So you want it a bit safer? Just a little bit. This needs to be programmed to each individual patient because we are all individuals. We all walk at different speeds and have different characteristics in the way we do it. Yeah, well, that's safe, isn't it? Great. Within maybe about six weeks to eight weeks, you might need to reprogram because you gain confidence, you find what you can do, what yeah. you can't do, and yeah. then we need to go in, change the program, and that's it. Muscle control signals from Carlin Pierce's brain are detected by sensors resting on the skin inside her electric arm. They then activate a motorised hand. It's the same as if you did it with your normal hand. If you tense, it, your hands will close. I hope they actually get the hands to f every finger to move, because at the moment it's only the first three fingers that move but I hope that they can actually develop it so it could possibly move at its full capacity instead of just the first three fingers. And they're actually developing it at the moment that they've just started to do anyway, that the wrist actually turns. Instead of me just turning it like that itself, it can, you can actually well, just control it instead of thinking about it to turn itself. For Kleins, there is no end to this process. No matter how much we enhanced ourselves, we would still retain our essential humanity. He believes that one day we might even choose to exist as disembodied brains, receiving thoughts and feelings via electrical implants. Eventually, we will be able to maintain our real essence without the benefit of having to look after our body to that extent. A brain by itself, given the proper environment that it needs, could exist for thousands of years and experience 
fully and more than that of a person with a normal body. Electrical implant technology is no scientific dream. It may just be that you're just adjusting to it, take a bit of time. A cochlear implant is the first bionic sense organ that really works. It's for people who are too deaf to use hearing aids. They've lost all the hair cells in their inner ear that can change sound into electrical impulses for the brain. And it consists of an electrical um, implant which fits into the inner ear and stimulates it electrically rather than with sound waves. So what we'll do is we'll just start off with a very quiet sounds. Let me know when you can hear them. Well, there's a very important stage of rehabilitation where we're training uh, the patients to learn what the new signals mean. To start with, it sounds just like a Dalek. People are very disappointed. But then the brain has this amazing ability to fit the new signals together with the old memories. And what happens after a year or two is it's the old memories that become the perceptions so that people actually hear their friends and families and relations speaking as they remember they used to speak. It's just a little bit louder, isn't it, when you altered it yeah, slightly? It's like down to five. Mm -hmm. One and a does, half. It, does it sound any clearer? Mm, I'm not straining. Not straining. Mm. Good. What about the quality of your own voice? How is that? Well, it's getting a little better. <laughs> you think so? Does it sound more deep, your own voice? Um, yes. Given me a lot of confidence back now. I'm doing so much more that I couldn't do before. I'm involved, getting involved in more things now. There are enormous demands for uh, electrodes which can be placed in parts of the brain to control um, epilepsy and various other neurological conditions to stimulate limbs that can't function because of uh, nerve damage. And I think this is only really the beginning of central nervous system a discrete electrical stimulation. Already we can put this electrode into the brain stem well beyond the ear in patients who've lost their nerves of hearing because of acoustic neuroma, a benign tumor on the nerve of hearing. And this is something that nobody dreamt of 10 years ago. This work is a direct forerunner of some of the technologies needed to create Kleins's brain in a bottle. The idea of keeping the brain alive for a period after the rest of the body has largely disintegrated isn't so uh, far-fetched at all. I think the question is not if it's possible, but if it's desirable. Is this desirable? Well, well of course it is. If I had the choice of dying or continuing as a brain, I would certainly pick the latter. Cyborg technology is a very two-edged, actually. There's a story, um, to get confessional, about my grandmother. She had a pacemaker implanted in her chest um, about 15 years ago. And because of that, cyborgian technology, she lived for 10 extra years. Then she had a stroke and her brain died. And normally, the doctor said, when your brain dies like this, um, your heart stops. The brain does not send the signals to the heart, and it just stops beating. And she would have passed along peacefully, as she wished, with no intense medical interventions. But she had a pacemaker. So the pacemaker kept telling her heart to beat. So for day after day, she was a cyborg donor, as uh, Linda Hoger would say. She was a dead cyborg lying there. Her body would not die because her heart kept beating. She was double dead, but not triple dead. And not only was that horrendous, was that very disconcerting for my family, but it almost became a financial disaster. Uh, med medical insurance almost ran out, and we, we weren't allowed to tell the doctors to turn off the pacemaker. That would have been an intervention. That would have been killing her, although her brain was long dead. This piece of cyborgian apparatus that had given her 10 years of good life gave her 10 weeks of horrible death, and it nearly bankrupted my family. So we can see that cyborgism is a very dual-edged phenomena. It's not one we can hide from and run away from, but it's one, I think, being an optimist, that we can have much more control of, that we can 
actually have participatory evolution, or in fact evolution is just going to happen to us, like a train wreck, and that would be a very ugly thing to see. Cyborgs aren't just humans with bits of machines in their bodies. Cyborgs are humans with technologically enhanced abilities. The amplified human, more aware, more powerful, more competitive, has been a military goal for 50 years. But the military never used the word cyborg. It is too emotive. When the military sends, the US military, any high-tech military, sends troops somewhere, they don't say, really, in their planning, they don't say, we will send so many men or women, so many soldiers here. They say, we will send so many weapon systems here, each weapon system being so many people, so many machines. Donna Haraway, biologist and historian, has followed cyborgs as they filtered out of the military. The image of the machine that came out of research in World War II was of a machine that could control its own processes, machines that could model intelligence, that could be feedback controlled, where communications machines, information systems, and organisms come into a kind of new contact, a kind of hybridization, so that cyborgs are organisms plus information machines. The earliest theorization of cyborgs around 1960, where the man in space program requiring some kind of enhanced man, the masculinism of it was right up front, it was um, the sort of primary meaning of cyborg. Cyborg was born from um, post-World War II, permanently militarized um, first world science. And that kind of belly of the monster place where cyborgs was born is always some place that I found, not so much that I want to be, as that I am as a person born in my culture and trying to come to terms with it. and others argue that we are all cyborgs. The machines around us don't just follow our actions, they monitor us, anticipate us, satisfy our needs. Technology enjoins us and enhances us all. If you live in the West or if you're an elite person in the third world, you're part of the cyborg society because you exist in a matrix of machines and information and energy transfers that totally shaped your lives, that you probably couldn't exist and survive without. And so you may sit at home and say, I'm no Robocop, I'm no Terminator. But uh, while you aren't Robocop or Terminator, you're one of their cousins. You are a type of cyborg. How can I help? Yes, I'd like to make a booking, please. That's for the Morgana Hotel. That's right. And how many people be traveling with you? Just one. In cyborg society, the landscape of the stock market now looks like a virtual battlefield. The group that our products really appeal to is younger. They tend to be of the MTV generation. They want to drink information from a fire hose, so to speak. Using these glasses, you can see a virtual environment in which the stock market information is represented as a variety of polls uh, telling you information about the market, as we're seeing here, the volume of shares traded. Each poll represents the stock of a particular company. The blue part of the poll represents the volume traded. It can also represent the price, um, the number of shares you hold, whether you're making or, or losing money. Once you're attached and augmented with computing devices, you become a cyborg. This technology enhances the person's ability to make money.
Down on the street, cyborgs are busy forming new cyber communities. The electronic superhighway, the internet, grew out of the US military communication system and is linking vast networks of computers around the planet. Terminal users can access never-ending discussions on any topic. We put public access terminals in, in cafes throughout San Francisco to allow people who don't have computers to participate in the electronic revolution the way people would participate from home with their home computers. People ask you a question, rather than, than being verbose about it, you put a very simple answer. Boom, it's out there. People know it. You, you reveal things about yourself that you would otherwise would never reveal just because of the spontaneity and the restriction. Those two things uh, together um, really make for a, uh, an explosive combination. Cyberspace is in your imagination. It lives in your imagination. It's this intangible thing. It's really a place, a public forum, where anyone can get in and listen to ideas and comment on ideas. And whether you're homeless or whether you're a part of uh, the, the social elite, your voice is no louder or less loud than anyone else. In cyborg society, being enhanced is a matter of necessity. As in war and business, technological enhancement in sport is simply crucial to success. I was an engineer for 12 years. Um, basically, it's just bioengineering. It's understanding what makes a body work, analyzing them as a person as opposed to the medical perspective of treating a knee problem is you have a knee problem, you address the knee. But from a, a mechanical background, I will tend to look at what will influence the knee and how then we can influence the knee and also the person. We treat the person here as opposed to just a mechanical problem. So you're missing it. So by the time you're becoming efficient, you've missed that part of the power stroke. So what I think we'll probably do is if we looked at the mechanics of it, we'd need to take you further back on your seat. We'd need to take the seat height up so that the lever arm here was more efficient. Push and pull forward. Fire's quarter way there. Keep that quality. Keep it going. Quality's good. Seven to third. Push and pull eight. Keep it going now. Go to halfway. Ten's halfway turning. Work out nine. Push and pull eight. Keep it going seven. Work out six. Nearly there. Three quarters. Five to go. Keep in four. Work out three. To the end. Dig in two. Push and pull. Five as you can. Rest. Ultimately, we want technology to help us win the greatest prize. Surrounded by ageless machines, we want to cheat death. You have to look upstream, um, look above the actual forces that are impacting our society today and ask, well, what are the impetuses for this? And you find that some of the basic uh, drives of Western culture are behind becoming a cyborg. The desire for immortality, the desire for increased efficiency, especially winning wars, doing better business, um, doing better medicine, living longer. expectation that medicine should cure us at all costs has created a new range of million pound body scanners. Surgeons can now see the working of the body in real time. What we can do with this kind of machinery that you see here, uh, certainly in the future, will be to put that information together so the information we get from one particular technique can be integrated with that from another so that something which shares the skin best the bones best, the brain best, can all be put together so that we have got a complete human being uh, within our computer. During the Gulf War, images that were being taken in the desert in reasonably primitive uh, medical tents were being examined under very sophisticated viewing circumstances, a few seconds later, uh, in America, the images had been transferred by satellite. The military experience will again change how the public interface with technology and drive expectations higher. Instead of taking a day off work, coming into the hospital, they could perhaps combine some simple imaging studies with their shopping expedition. Once we were ill when we felt ill, but with diagnostic machines and our feedback loops, we'll be told we're ill before we know it.
We are now powerful beings, freewheeling on the cyborg highway. If we fall off, technology can help us climb back on board. Mike Brown owns a chain of climbing shops. He was made paraplegic by a skiing accident a year ago. As well as using a wheelchair, he wears a high-tech metal frame, which assists him as he walks. Um, whilst it looks quite easy to walk in this device, it's required a lot of uh, practice and a lot of training. Um, and there has to be a minimal level of uh, fitness and strength, really, to, to make the most of the device. But having said that, you know, there's an awful lot of people that would, would find it beneficial. The brace is a great social piece of equipment. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you can go into a meeting and talk at eye level. Um, uh, you, you can go to the pub and drink at eye level. I don't want to be looked down on as being disabled. I want to be who I am. And uh, the brace allows me to get a little bit closer to normality. Cyborg society is pressing on relentlessly, maintaining its impetus and drives. Technology is evolving faster than Homo sapiens, taking over more and more human functions. The strive towards enhancement, of course, is what's going to lead to the post-human. It's behind the original cyborg ideal that Klein came up with, that we engineer humans so they could go and live in space without space. Mind, mind, mind. Cyborgs are everywhere and as diverse as humans. Beth Custer is exploring technology to make music. Sensors strapped to her body monitor her heart rate, brain waves, stress levels and muscle movements. The signals influence various music synthesizers. Just by thinking, feeling and moving, she creates different sounds. The adventure that started when the fish left the water, for us, is perhaps only just beginning, because the new insights that we get from molecular biology, from computers, and from being hooked together in the internet is bound to have major social implications. We're standing at the threshold of the most wonderful progress uh, that would help humanity. <laughs> We cyborgs are happy to re-engineer our bodies, desperate to enhance ourselves and driven to live longer, stronger and better. Now technology is set to discover how we might do that genetically. The machine is entering our essential humanity. Can we control it? Cyborg technologies have moved from the military into our bodies, from the business world into our homes. Not only are we augmenting our senses, we are also engineering our children. Cyborg parents no longer need bodies. Genetic material can be deposited in a semen bank for future use. Three components of what makes the semen industry 
something that may experience a boom. One of them is the AIDS epidemic. Another is increased geneticism. And the third factor is increased environmental hazards and environmental toxins, which compromise fertility. And I think the semen industry has capitalized on those three components of a changing environment. Semen industry offers techno semen, which is a process through creating a new, improved, more pristine body product than what is actually embodied in a male. It's something that's gone through different technical, biologic, social, and mystical processes. In other words, it can be proven to be disease-free. It can be proven to be more fertile than what is actually embodied. They put the semen through things like pre-sex selection, which may end up allowing something to have more probability of giving a child of a certain gender. This is a vial of semen that's been frozen for about six days from one of our donors who is in screening. And we're going to determine if a proper number of sperm survived the freezing. So far, it doesn't, it doesn't meet the minimum criteria. We require at least 20 million sperm per cc to survive in order for the sample to be accepted. And I've counted 17 million so far active sperm. In Oakland, California, one semen bank is trying to adapt the technology to the needs of the people they are helping to create. There isn't any other sperm bank that has a policy that encourages or even enables donors to be located or discovered by the children. In fact, the traditional notion has been that you absolutely must maintain secrecy. And our, our emphasis here is really looking at who are the stakeholders, you know, who's receiving this product, what families are formed, and what about the children as key people. I think semen banking is going to become much more corporate. In other words, there are small semen banks which are being gobbled up by bigger corporations. Multinationals are beginning to buy semen banks and other human biologics like fetal tissue, blood banks, eye banks, and creating big conglomerates, kind of like the McDonaldizations of semen banking. And I believe that it's going to become a much more complicated process for the individual woman to actually purchase the semen. When the business of making families um, in addition to distributing a product. And our emphasis is more on the low-tech end of semen banking. You know, the product that people get is as good as anybody else's or any other sperm bank's product. But our approach is really in interacting with the clients, getting them to choose their own donors, encouraging them to have dialogue with their family members and their children. We have lots of babies from our 12 years of work. With cyborg technologies, there is a danger of treating people as if they are machines. Laboratory offspring are still human. They need protecting. But it's only slowly that we're learning how to do it. Earlier this year, uh, there was controversy uh, arose from some work where they came to the conclusion that they could take the, the eggs from an aborted fetus, insert them into uh, an adult woman, uh, in order for, for that person to have a child. Um, a lot of people were, I think, in common sense terms, scandalised by the possibility and, and uh, debate started in the press. But it rather concluded uh, prematurely, perhaps in some people's eyes, because there's still an official uh, um, government uh, investigation into the implications of it, uh, by a, a journalist simply saying, well, let's look at this from the point of view of the, of, of the unborn child. Uh, a lot of children who have been brought up by parents who are not uh, genetically uh, their own parents do, once they're adults, search for their parents, their real uh, genetic parents. And in this case, they would, of course, come across their grandparents, and they would then have to ask their grandparents why they murdered their mother. And that rather concluded the whole discussion uh, and, and I think put the kibosh on, on that line of research. But it was totally unpredictable that a society, or that our society, should come to that sort of conclusion in that sort of way, in that short space of time. On other issues, it might take us two or three generations, maybe even a century, to come to terms with, with, with some of these technologies. You're pregnant, and like most pregnant women, you're wondering, will my baby be born healthy and normal? If your health care provider has told you that you are at an increased risk of having a child with a serious birth defect, prenatal diagnosis may offer you an answer to this question. Mothers have long had to come to terms with the intrusion of technology. It now drives the experience of birth. 
the human perspective has shifted. ...are available for a number of genetic diseases such as Down syndrome, Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell anemia, and cystic fibrosis. Your genetic counselor will give you additional specific information and answer questions you may have about the procedures, risk, and your own situation. Whether or not you decide to have prenatal diagnosis is up to you. But whatever your choice, try to keep in mind that most babies are born perfectly healthy. We like to try and keep birth as natural a process as we can, but in many instances, technology is available and provides us with information that certainly impacts on reproduction. Unfortunately, sometimes this is information that the couple doesn't want, um, and I think we have to be very sensitive to that. It can't be detected by tests? Or... There, there are a lot of things that we don't pick up with either CBS or AMNEO, and they would be the general kinds of birth defects that anyone would have a risk for in pregnancy. We'll pick up any kind of chromosome problem that there might be, an extra chromosome, a rearrangement, um, extra little markers or missing pieces of chromosomes. Little wiggles for you. Is that the baby? Uh-huh. So Hi here's baby, the head. It's mom. <laughs> for many couples, this is the first time that they've really had concrete evidence that there is a fetus there and that they're pregnant. Here's a little hand up here waving at you. Hi, Here's the heartbeat. I think that it enhances in many ways the bonding process starting much earlier and to a much different degree being able to actually visualize the fetus on ultrasound. So yes, I think it does have impact. Pretty good picture. Sure. <laughs> Pretty good picture. You have wallet size in these? <laughs> Technology changes the way that women experience their, their births. They don't think anymore about um, quickening as, you know, the, the sign that they're really pregnant. They think about, you know, I'm really pregnant now because I've had this test that says my fetus will live and it will be healthy um, and it will, like, fit into society in a particular way. Um, it's not handicapped. I'm doing the right thing by carrying it to term. And so that becomes sort of the new framework around which women think about themselves and their babies. I think that unfortunately for many couples it's added a significant amount of anxiety to their pregnancies. And this will keep the transducer sterile. Okay, I'll take a look. You're doing great, man. Okay. okay, let me go make sure it's a good sample. Okay. I just need to go look under the microscope, okay? okay. We like to think of the fetus as a patient also, and I think there are many potential interventions that will be available for the fetus in the future. One of the types of interventions that we do now is fetal surgery that is only applicable in a limited number of cases for fetuses with certain structural defects, but in those cases we're able to exteriorize the fetus and repair the defect and then replace the fetus in the uterus. But the need for fetal surgery will probably be limited as genetic therapies begin to tackle many conditions. The techniques on trial treat fetuses with healthy genes which correct the defect. And there's the possibility of even earlier treatment of the embryo in, in that treatment would affect every cell, including the germ cell, the sperm and the egg, and that would be a type of correction that could be passed on. Many people feel very uncomfortable with those types of modifications, and those are debates, ethical debates, that need to be discussed way before any of that type of therapy is attempted. And there will be more to debate. This lab is part of the Human Genome Mapping Project, a global undertaking to find the 100,000 genes which control the growth and function of humans. So far, 5,000 have been located. We are in a remarkable stage of the study of the human genome at the moment. We are just beginning to find ways of accumulating a vast amount of knowledge, much more than we ever dreamed possible of even a few years ago. What this will do is provide the essential information for a much greater understanding of many of the processes of the human body and also what happens when they go wrong. For Dr. Manfred Kleins, 
This is just the beginning of a new, powerful cyborg technology. They will come when we'll be able to implant the genes for, for speech into animals. And when they start to be able to speak, we will no longer regard them as animals. Suddenly, they will become something else than animals. And what the legal, just imagine what the legal system will have to do when all of a sudden a dog or a, a chimp or one, some other animal can speak English. Inevitably, the acquisition of knowledge using a lot of technology, a lot of new techniques, does inspire sometimes um, rather creative ideas. It is certainly true that we will be able to identify genes involved in speech, in learning, and in aging, and that we will be able to manipulate those genes in such a way as to look at their function more precisely, possibly in different uh, animals. What is not clear is whether we would ever either be able to or wish to use that kind of technology to actually design new functions or new genomes. The emphasis of our work is very much towards uh, improving health conditions and understanding of mankind rather than tampering with it unnecessarily. But advanced knowledge can create difficulties. What will we do with a deeper understanding of the role of specific genes? What that information is likely to give us uh, is a number of moral worries and a number of political worries. Uh, we'll have moral worries about uh, whether to counsel people who have genetic deficiencies about whether they should, should have children or not. Uh, a lot of people in those situations have already made it clear that they would rather not know, for instance, that there might be a 20% possibility of, of having, say, a Down syndrome baby. They would rather not know that. Uh, and having been told it, uh, they don't know how to deal with that sort of probability. Uh, people have a great deal of difficulty dealing with, with statistical probabilities about what might or might not happen with them. Uh, so, so you have a problem there. The other problem uh, is, is that some of that information on the human genome will be commercially useful to people who take risks uh, to do with, with, with human health. And clearly, uh, the whole life insurance business would be immensely more profitable if they could cut out of, of, of their policies uh, people who are genetically disposed to, to an early death or an expensive illness. So why should John Q. Citizen care about cyborgs? The answer is in the Terminator movies. The future of humanity, or post-humanity if you will, is going to be decided, either consciously or unconsciously, by those of us alive today and by our children and grandchildren. At the rate of technological change, by the time our grandchildren grow up, many things will be decided. These technologies don't happen in a vacuum. Some little doctor isn't off creating cyborgian technologies or re-engineering mice and humans genetically. It takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of resources. Usually they come from taxpayers and from shareholders and others, usually from taxpayers though, and the shareholders reap the profits. And people should be aware of that and they should start asking, is this what we want? Technology satisfies the demand for profit being a cyborg society may mean accepting the machining of the human, but it also demands that the machine should be humanized. Dr. Manfred Kleins's speaking chimps and disembodied brains may be around the corner. He believes our humanity will stay intact, but can we take the chance? At 7 o'clock next Sunday, Equinox looks at the future of the world's coral reefs.